Good morning. I'm Paul Menace, and along with my co-vice president for of the Arizona Archaeological and Historical Society, lovingly known as Ark and Hiss, uh, we are really pleased to collaborate with the Amerind uh, Foundation Museum today. The presentation today is really extraordinary. It's based on the Vanderwagen collection. It's an amazing assemblage of Zuni and Navajo artwork collected by gen literally generations of the Vanderwagens with the foresight and hope that this collection would be an educational tool, not only to understand this important indigenous art form, but also to understand the artists who made it themselves. With its the collections curation at the Amerind, uh, it has a secure place in perpetuity and we're really excited about that. You know, the Arizona Archaeological Historical Society is over 100 years old and the Amerind is over 80 years old. And we are delighted that as far as we can tell, this is the first collaborative effort between these two venerable uh, organizations in Southern Arizona. Today, um, we will begin with a 40 minute pre-recorded program led by the Ameren CEO and president, Dr. Eric Caldal. This will be followed by a live question and answer period. So if you wanna ask a question at the end of the program, uh, use Zoom's Q&A feature. Before Hello, my name is Annie Larkin. I'm the Associate Curator of Public Programs at the Ameren Museum. Ameren is located one hour to the east along I-10 outside of Tucson in Dragoon, Arizona. Ameren houses a fine collection of native art and cultural objects, and we are dedicated to promoting the knowledge and understanding of the native peoples of the Americas through research, education, conservation, and community engagement. And today we'll be talking to our chief curator, as well as president and CEO, Dr. Eric Caldall, about the Vanderwagen Jewelry Collection. I'm happy to be able to introduce to you today Dr. Eric Caldall, who is the President, CEO, and Chief Curator of Amerind. What's new at Amerind, Eric? What's new at Amerind this yes. summer? Uh -huh. uh, well, we've had a really busy summer. So, of course, because of the pandemic crisis, we did close down the museum. But we finally reopened after four months on August 1st. So if you come to visit us today, we're open six days a week from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, Tuesday through Sunday. We're only closed on Mondays and major holidays. Now we did put into place some new uh, health and safety measures that we'd ask everybody's cooperation helping us out with. Now when you visit the museum, please maintain a good social distance. Uh, please wear a mask. Those are required in our facilities. And we have um, locations throughout the museum where people can sanitize their hands and uh, refresh themselves uh, throughout their visit here. The other exciting thing that happened this summer is we uh, embarked on a $400,000 renovation project to air condition this building. This is, of course, our historic museum building right behind us. Uh, it was built in stages between 1936 and 1954. And for the first time since 1936, it has a modern air conditioning system. So not only can you come here in the summer, but you can actually enjoy the experience mm. of seeing some of our beautiful exhibits. And today I'm really excited to share with you the Van der Wecken collection, which has been the work of many years. It's an amazing collection, maybe one of the best collections of its kind in the world. Eric, would you tell us a little bit about the history of the Van der Wagen Jewelry Collection? Well, sure. Uh, it's probably one of the most unique collections of its kind anywhere in the world. Uh, there are certainly beautiful collections of jewelry, uh, but let me tell you a little bit about what makes this, this collection unique. Uh, it's a collection that was assembled over a century of time and by three generations of one family, the Van der Wagens. And the patriarch and matriarch of the family, you can see in this historical photograph behind me, Effa and Andrew Van der Wagen. They actually uh, were missionaries and they visited the Pueblo of Zuni in the very late 1890s and they established a mission there. They became really richly involved in the community and its life, uh, even while they were trying to carry out their mission's purpose and program. Uh, there was unfortunately a terrible tragedy uh, early in their time. There was a smallpox epidemic that ripped through the community and Andrew and Effa pitched in to do what they could to help the community get through that. And that really 
cemented their place as part of the fabric uh, of this community there because they were there to try to be helpful to make the world a better place by their presence. Um, and that ramified out into everything that they would ultimately do. Now, it came to Andrew's attention that maybe one of the best things he could do was to establish an economic hub. There were already trading posts in the Pueblo of Zuni uh, when they arrived, and eventually he would buy one of those out. And in 1910, he opened a store that uh, still has operations. Uh, it's still carried on by descendants over many generations after the Zethi initial van der Wackens. Now, Effa had an idea very early on. Effa started to set in as part of their business of buying and selling Native American arts and crafts and cultural objects. Um, she started to set aside pieces for a museum collection someday. Uh, didn't know when that was going to be, but she set aside collections for someday. And that collection continued to grow in her children's generation. And that collection continued to grow in her grandchildren's generation. And finally, it was a grandson, and he prefers that he remain anonymous, so I will not be using his name today. Uh, finally, a grandson decided that it was time to give this to a museum. And by that time, that collection was thousands of pieces. We're, not, we're still cataloging it. Uh, the Ameren Foundation, when we were chosen by the family to receive this gift, uh, was back in 2014. So it's been six years now that we've been slowly working on this collection. We have over eight and a half thousand pieces cataloged to date and photographed and described. There's still several thousand pieces ahead of us uh, that we're working on. So this collection had been generated over a century, uh, and the donors had made a conscious decision that they wanted people to understand the stories of the people who created it and the techniques that they pioneered as jewelers, as artists, as designers. Uh, so they made lots of decisions like they have templates and early drawings of pieces that were going to be completed later. They have raw materials that they used. They have pieces that are in different stages of production. And they put all of this aside with the idea that somewhere this is how we're going to teach the world about the incredible jewelry arts that were made by Diné and Ashwi people at the Pueblo of Zuni from the latest part of the 1800s all the way through the latest part of the 20th century. How is the exhibit arranged, Eric? Well, when you come to uh, visit the exhibit, you're going to see four different cases around the room. And each of them has its own theme. So the first case explores a little bit about uh, the economic importance of creating these art forms and being involved in their sale and trade. The next case talks a little bit about uh, how many different people were involved in a collaborative process to create these objects. Uh, the case after that talks about the raw materials and the different designs uh, that were incorporated into this art form. And then the last talks about actual different techniques uh, that we see represented in the collection. So, uh, and if you come and you're a visitor here and you wanna see this, you'll uh, come up to a case and you'll see that there are little uh, identifying numbers uh, throughout, and you can go up to our front desk and check out this booklet. Uh, this was put together, uh, this particular booklet, with the help of our donor. Uh, and whenever we can, we list who created it or how many different people worked on a piece, uh, what year it came from, and what are the raw materials and techniques that are represented in the piece. You can check these out from our front desk, and just to reassure people about health and safety, uh, we do disinfect these uh, between each use by our visitors. I wanted to focus on this piece first, if I could. Um, this is, again, a collaborative jewelry piece. It's a beautiful bracelet. Uh, it dates to the 1930s, maybe a little bit earlier. It's, by, uh, it's a collaboration between two artists. One of them was a Diné, uh, Diné excuse me, why am I my pronunciation? Silversmith, his name was Charlie Wilson. And the lapidary that you see here, all the stonework was done by a gentleman by the name of Mingo Dooley, who was from the Pueblo of Zuni. And I bring this up because this is something that our donor brings up with me over and over and over again about the importance of the collection. See, Mingo Dooley, the lapidary who created this piece, uh, Mingo Dooley was a very important early stonecutter and artisan, uh, late 19th century, early 20th century at SUNY. He trained his children, trained grandchildren, he trained son-in-laws and daughters-in-laws. He was a really important figure. 
But by the time our donor, who, if you remember, is a grandson of the founding family members of, of the Van der Weggen family at SUNY, by the time our donor was in the business, um, Mr. Dooley's name was systematically being forgotten. And some of his pieces, which would then circulate uh, in, uh, in the trade, pieces that were already completed and being bought and sold, uh, were being attributed to other artists. So his name was being forgotten. And actually, our donor knew him when he was a very young man, when he was a boy. And he looked up to him and he admired this artist. And he said, this is wrong, that people are forgetting who created these artworks. So the Van der Wagen collection actually has a mission statement to it that was, came to us from our donating, donating family. And it's not about the Van der Wagens. It's not even about the business of trading posts. It's not about the economics of trading posts. The mission statement of the Van der Wagen collection is to help us remember the names of the artisans who created all these things so that they are not forgotten, so that they are never erased from history. Uh, so having the incredible detail of this multi-thousand piece collection where we can tell you who made it and when it was made and who collaborated on pieces really brings to life the story of these pieces. And that is ultimately the purpose that the Van der Wagens want this collection to achieve. They don't want us just to show it here, and we're in plans to create some traveling exhibits. They want to show people about this amazing art form and share it with the whole world. And they want people to know about the artists primarily and what their lives were like and what this meant to their homes. Another piece by uh, Mr. Dooley is in this case, and it's another collaborative work. Can you hang on to mm -hmm. that? Thanks. This necklace is another very early piece, um, 1930s, 1940s. All the lapidary work is again by Mr. Dooley. The silversmithing here is done by another Ashawi artist. Uh, his name was Tom Wiyaki, and we'll see several of his pieces today. And then um, the beads, uh, all of those beads that you see, sometimes we take beads for granted. And if anything I learned working with the Van der Weyen family is don't take beads for granted. <laughs> These beads were all handmade. So what does that mean? So that means on an individual bead, uh, you cut out a little circle of silver two identical circles of silver. You smash them. Yeah, we can lower that so you're not straining. There we go. You smash them to make two hemispheres, and then you solder them together, and then you repeat. There were some people who all they did was make handmade beads. Uh, this was a husband and wife team, both of them did knit artists, uh, Tom and Grace Yazi, and they made tens and thousands of beads to support the jewelry industry. So this piece is actually the work of several artists, and that's a theme that we'll see over and over again, who collaborates together, who works together. And sometimes they're speaking different languages, sometimes they're from different families uh, to create these incredible works of art. Let's tuck that back into its case. So I mentioned, um, come on. that these artisans uh, were doing this for an economic purpose. And you'll come here and you'll see this beadwork, and you're like, why is that beadwork in these cases with this jewelry? You know, our donating family really wanted us to see these pieces of beadwork in this exhibit and as part of the collection. These are uh, Zuni-made pieces. Uh, and before jewelry really took off and before it became the major global industry that it is today, uh, one of the very first art forms they promoted was the speedwork. And they were really promoting the speedwork, at least the Van der Wagen family was involved with the beadwork, shortly after that smallpox epidemic that I mentioned in the very late 1890s. Uh, there was a lot of hardship in the community and there was a lot of need for cash to come into the city uh, and to benefit the community. So the Van der Wagens and others uh, encouraged the creation of native arts that could be sold not just at Zuni, but could be sold around the country. That would be very popular, that would be very consumable, and that would bring dollars back to the, to the community. And that's where this beadwork gets its start. So before jewelry becomes quite as important to the economy as it ultimately would, uh, beadwork was one of the first forms that they promoted. 
This piece uh, dates to the midst of the Great Depression. And what I want to draw your attention to is actually the bolo cord. You know, it's something we don't really think about very often. Bolo cords, they're part of supporting this beautiful artwork on the end. Well, the bolo cords, one of the things that uh, they tried to do was there was a cottage industry of people who would weave leather into bolo cords. And at least uh, in the Van der Wagen business enterprise, those people were people who had challenges with their sight or who were completely blind or low vision uh, as something that they could do to bring some dollars home uh, that they could do with the skill of their hands. Just another way to demonstrate all the different economic ramifications that these arts and crafts provided to the people who created them and to their families. What is the theme of this display case, Eric? Well, this case is called It Takes a Community. And in an, I, I'm trying to point out something that I learned, because I certainly was new uh, when I started working on this project. And I, you know, the amount that I don't know is still <laughs> an unfathomable amount of ocean that I have to cross. Um, and I'm so grateful to everybody who shared their knowledge with me. Um, this piece is a collaborative piece between a husband and wife, Virgil and Shirley Ben, and it's one of my most favorite pieces in the collection. You know, when we were first starting out uh, sharing this collection with the Tucson community, I had some traveling exhibits I took, and I took pieces by uh, Virgil and Shirley out with me. And some people would look at them, and then they would get closer, and then they would get closer, and they would say, is that a painting? Is that an enamel paint? Said, no, no, this is all lapidary. It's the most incredibly beautiful sculptural execution of lapidary that I have ever seen. And it was done jointly between a husband and a wife. And that's a theme that we see over and over again that I had to learn was that, you know, today this is a global industry. I mean, there are people who collect Zuni and Navajo jewelry from Europe to Japan and back again. Uh, and a lot of times people want to know, well, it was made by one artist, right? Or it was, came from one community or tell me what particular culture uh, over there in the Americas created this. And it's actually the work of a lot of different artists sharing their vision, sharing their talents to create any singular piece. And it's pretty obvious when you have a husband and wife that they're working together, but sometimes you have people who have no relationship to each other at all except friendship and a respect for each other's work that created some of these pieces. So let me take you to another masterpiece that I'm really uh, fond of. Let's tuck this back into its case. These are both Ashwi artists. Um, the silver work on this jewelry box was done by Tom Wiaki, and the lapidary on it was done by Rose Pinzion. And if you've ever visited Zuni, I'm sure some, a lot of people uh, viewing this tour today have probably been up uh, to visit and to shop. Um, I can't say enough about how welcoming the Zuni community is and how, uh, you know, you and I have both mm -hmm. been there and we've had artists welcome us into their studios, um, show us everything that they're working on. It's just a beautiful place to visit. Right behind the town is this incredible mesa, uh, which in English translates to Corn Mountain. And she's represented that in stone and shell on this piece. And it's just a beautiful work of art. And then, um, Mr. Ryaki, the silversmith, has hand carved these corn plants growing in the field. And then there's this rainbow figure that uh, Rose inlaid uh, all around uh, those, that detail in the silver work. And then to close up the bottom of the box, he's made these custom made silver beads uh, in the shape of human hands holding the box together. It's just a really work of love. And these two were great artists um, who collaborated on pieces like this to make great art. Now the appetite for Native American jewelry uh, became ever more immense as the 20th century continued. Uh, and certainly um, post-World War II, it took off the 1970s. Uh, people uh, who were alive and in the business in the 1970s still remember trying to keep everything going out the door. So it was really important to sustain a high level of output and quality. So here's uh, an example of high output and quality. So there were families who were incredible at lapidary work. And uh, in this case, they would get an order in from a client 
And they would say, you know, make 20 or 30 pieces, just like this one. Same style, same design. Um, color choices are your own. Uh, but lay out 20 or 30 of these, and you'll see that this little one is glued to a piece of cardstock. So that cardstock would then, uh, so there would be a contract let from a client. A family would put together 20 or 30 or more of these. Then they would bring them back in, and then a new contract would be let to set these in silver. So it could be a completely different family. who then would get all of those uh, pieces on cardboard. And then it was their job to create the silver housing that would uh, hold that lapidary work. So it became collaborative. And certainly at the Pueblo of Zuni, uh, this is well known and, and documented historically, there are a lot of families from a lot of different cultures who end up settling at Zuni and becoming part of the Zuni community, including a lot of people from the Navajo Nation. Um, silversmiths and lapidaries, were sharing work back and forth to supply that ever-growing industry uh, and to make their families uh, as successful a group of artists as they could possibly be in the industry. So you can't have a squash blossom without a bunch of silver beads uh, to put it all together. Uh, you know, most of these beautiful pieces feature gorgeous beadwork. And while today there are, are techniques, there are machines that can stamp out silver beads very quickly. Uh, for most of the collection that we have at Amarant, all of these beads were almost universally handmade. We have a few examples of the machine technique, but almost everything else is handmade. And I bring these two up. Um, these two uh, chains of silver beads have a lot in common. These would have been sold as is rather than worked into somebody else. But I bring them up because this is two sisters, Ella and Eva Chai. Uh, they lived uh, in the closer to Zuni. They were Navajo in background themselves. And they have this really distinctive form. So this, this is an incredible amount of work. So each of these beads is carefully graduated. So it will lay nicely on the wearer's neck, uh, getting progressively smaller. So that means they had a set of tools to stamp out these little silver discs in a different series of graduated sizes. And then before they uh, would smush them into forming these hemispheres, they would actually go through and hand stamp each of those silver discs to create this beautiful lacy detail on both sides of the bead. Then they would smash them into the hemisphere shape, then they would solder them together, and then they would polish them to the point that you can hardly see the solder line. This is what their family did. This was their part of the industry, and they were high artists in their particular part of the industry, and this would be combined with other works of art. Uh, to create and supply the jewelry making industry that ultimately started to feed a whole world of consumers. I wanted to bring up how important it is to encourage young artists. So uh, this is a piece that dates to the latter part of the 20th century. It's by an artist named Michael Chavez. And it's a sculptural piece of silver. And it's actually incomplete. Um, he was employed by the Van der Wagen Enterprise actually as a bookkeeper. Um, but they were really employing him because he's an incredible silversmith. <laughs> and they wanted to give him access to the raw materials that were available in their store to let him create. Um, so he created this incredibly beautiful piece, and it isn't set with stones yet. It's still, it's finished silver, this beautiful sculptural piece, um, but it would have had some stone set in the eyes and stone set in the, the uh, uh, bogart here on the cuff. And the Vanderwagens, because they were envisioning that they were going to create a museum collection, not only were we recording who was making this and what year they were making it and how they were making it, but they would deliberately pull some things out of production and say, you know what? I'm going to keep that for the museum collection, never sell it. And I want people to see what it looks like to have a work in process so that someday when you visit a museum and see this collection and you learn about Michael Chavez, you can see his technique start to finish. And with that, I think we'll move on to uh, materials and design and move on from this case. Fantastic. So in other parts of this exhibit, we talk about different uh, techniques uh, by which things get made. And we take advantage of that decision that our donor made to collect all the different stages of production. Uh, and we also have another section that talks about the different raw materials and the inspiration for some of the designs that we see.
So uh, in this case that focuses on different techniques, uh, we have some sand casting and tufa casting. Uh, we do have a tufa cast uh, that's come into the collection. So this is where you would pour a bracelet, it's molten silver into this form, and then shape it into this form. Uh, but as you see, it doesn't have the high silver polish that it's going to have uh, when it reaches its final technique. And then that's the same pattern, but in this case, it's set with a stone. All of these examples that we have here are by Dene Silversmiths. Let me get a few more pieces out. So one of the beautiful techniques uh, is something called channel inlay. Um, so in this design that, uh, it's just an amazing piece of very contemporary art. Uh, this one happens to date from the 60s and 70s. Um, but you see that beautiful pattern and the play of different colors of turquoise. You know, what the artist had to do here was um, even every single one of those silver lines that you see there was a carefully set bezel uh, that then the stone went into. And it would have been a little bit proud to the surface as they were forming it. Something like you would see in this pendant, this is a work in process. So it would have been a little bit proud and a little bit rough and as they polish that down and clean it up, that beautiful abstract design would come up in that highly detailed polish. So in something like this one, this is a yet an earlier stage of production, the same kind of object. Uh, you see that the stones uh, being used here, the lapidary work is still proud to the surface and that'll get cut down smooth until you see that uh, amazing work of art come out and show itself to us. So we do have some of the tools of the trade and they run across the full century of the collection. So when things were just getting started, uh, it wasn't as easy as going to a mail order catalog and ordering your lapidary supplies. People had to be incredibly creative about the tools that they had to create and make from other things that they had available to them. This is a tool for stamping out one of those uh, hemispherical silver pieces. And you'll see that it's uh, been carefully carved out. So that will create a nice check texture uh, when the uh, silver disc is pressed into a hemispherical shape. That would be ideal for the start of a contra belt or a really large button. Um, this is recycled from a tractor and then hand carved uh, and a shaft of a tractor and hand carved to make these dies work. Then there's this part of a Model T So this was part of a Model T car, and the uh, artist here has worked with it to create this set of pistons uh, all in different graduated sizes. So when you see those different graduated beads and you see those different graduated hemispheres, this is the origin of that. So uh, there's a little uh, slit across the hemisphere of this part. And if you wanna grab that piece of uh, sheet metal, you would insert that piece of, in this case, this is not silver that we have on exhibit, but you would insert a sheet of silver and then you would stamp out the semicircle that you need. Today, there are a lot of other tools for doing this, but it's incredibly clever to take that old Model T part and create this tool. You know, any great craftsperson loves their tools. Uh, you know, when you and I were at uh, the Pueblo of Zuni and we were visiting with Mr. Carlton Hamon, uh, we got to go to his studio and he was incredibly generous. He let us take a lot of photos. Many of the artists did of their techniques and you'll see their photographs throughout our exhibit halls. And that was uh, thanks to their generosity, letting, them, letting us take those photos for this exhibit. And I looked to Mr. Hamon, who is a master contemporary jeweler. And I said, um, can we get a picture of you with one of your tools? And he said, yes, I know exactly the one that I want and he pulled up a pair of pliers that he had when he was a teenage boy that his grandmother had given him to learn how to become the silversmith that he would one day become. And he had kept them all those decades. Uh, and that's what he wanted his photograph taken with. So there are a lot of different techniques that I'd like to uh, draw people's attention to, but we don't really have the time. But I think this one is very instructive. So this is a bracelet and it's set up uh, to be a needlepoint bracelet. So this is what a finished 
bracelet of this type would look like. You know, what is the lapidary looking for? They're going to look for a stone with similar quality, clarity, and color. Then they're going to cut all of those stones down to that incredibly small size. They're going to mount it to a stick with some wax, and they're going to put it up against a grinding wheel until every stone looks like every other stone. It's an incredible process of detail, artistry, and precision. But before those stones get set, you have to create a housing for them. And this is equally an impressive piece of work. All of those are the settings for the stone, the bezels. And look at the incredibly fine, delicate silver work that goes into shaping each of those sheets of silver and then hand soldering them to the base that will then ultimately be the housing for that turquoise. This is why people love this jewelry. This is why it be has become a world phenomenon in consumption, the precision, the detail, the rhythm, the symmetry, the elegance, uh, all of these things are what define great Native American jewelry. And the Pueblo Zuni and the people who work there made and continue to make some of the best in the world. And I see here, Eric, you have a very special treat for our audience. You have some items that you have brought up from collection storage that are not on display currently. Yes. I mean, I get this question several times. For people familiar with uh, Ashwi Arts, um, you know, where are the fetishes? Where's the fetish necklaces? Where's the freestanding fetishes? And the truth is, when I was putting this exhibit together in 2018, we were still cataloging those. So I couldn't put them out because they were still coming in. And, you know, as I mentioned, this collection, we've cataloged over eight and a half thousand things with several thousand things to go. It's still a work in progress after six years. And then most importantly for the collection is all the paperwork that it comes with. Uh, the Van Der Wagen Business Enterprise uh, includes a century of business records that tells us who made what and when and for how much. Uh, all of that detail is what really makes the collection so very, very important. And we're still wrapping our arms around that incredibly large body of tens of thousands of documents uh, and how to integrate that. So this becomes uh, one of the best research centers that we can offer the world uh, who wants to really study um, a century of jewelry making and uh, how it came to be. So, you know, for those people who love fetishes, one of the great names uh, in fetish carvers was Likia. And uh, this is how things look when they come to us um, from our donor. Uh, he usually generally has gone through the collection as he gets ready to turn it over to our staff for cataloging and processing. And in this case, he's pulled out a bag full of materials that were all carved by the great Carver Lekia. And he went to great pains to identify when they were made in the course of Lekia's career. So middle in his career, late in his career, early in his career. And then our job Here's one of those famous Lekia leaves. That's from, uh, I think, Spondyla shell. Um, this would be incorporated on a really large uh, work, of, work of jewelry art uh, and mounted. He also did freeform fetishes. Uh, but you know, our job was to go through, photograph every single one of these, uh, measure each one of these, assign them a unique number so that we can always track them in perpetuity, uh, and then work with our donor's family to say, you know, when was this made? What do we know about this? Uh, why was this never used? So in this case, he deliberately set these aside uh, for his someday future museum collection so that they would have a representative example of Lekia in all stages of his creative life. Other surprising things that have come in, if you wanna hold that up for our viewers. So there's a whole bunch of table service in the collection. Uh, specially contracted uh, flatwares and baby spoons and goblets and silverwares. This is one of eight silver goblets, all of which were created by the uh, Ashwi silversmith, Tom Wiaki. So the collection, you know, the strength of the collection is that it runs the range from things that uh, were made uh, in large quantities uh, for consumption, perhaps not sold for very much money, 
to things that are unquestionably unique, one-of-a-kind masterworks, like Tom's work. Tom also um, took it as a personal challenge to create this incredible uh, lamp out of solid sheet silver. All of those are his hand-detailed carved uh, silver leaves uh, and other elements that have been appliqued onto the silver structure here. And he uh, acquired some really nice pieces of turquoise. This is a Persian turquoise that's set in the finial on top. Um, this is a master artist showing off what a master artist can do, <laughs> challenging himself to do uh, something that nobody else has ever done. And those are represented in the collection as well as the things that would have sold for five bucks or 10 bucks in large production. And that's part of why, you know, the Van der Wagen family elected uh, to entrust this collection into Amron's care. Um, one of the things, you know, as they were trying to find a someday home for this collection, um, they had this huge body of paperwork, which is going to take us years to do. And they had things that ran the gamut from things that would have sold for a few dollars to things that are one of a kind art forms. And they wanted a place that would take it all and value it all. And as an anthropological research institute, we're dedicated to understanding the human story. So it made sense for it to come to us. When he initially approached me, you know, he was very understated. Uh, I was walking around the museum. It was the year 2012. Uh, he came up to me out of nowhere and said, mm, I understand you're the curator. I said, yes, um, I have some jewelry. <laughs> Which was probably the greatest understatement of my career. I have some jewelry. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. Um, well, we'd be delighted to look at that. Um, and then he said, and I have some documents. Would your museum be interested in some documents? Because what I would later learn was that there were other museums who we approached who weren't interested in the documents. They didn't have the capacity to deal with it. I said, well, of course. I mean, that's, that's part of the story. That's where the story is. That's the research value. And so ultimately, after thinking about it and discussing with us for well over a year or so, uh, he decided that he was going to put the collection here. One of the last pieces I want to share from the back rooms, which I have not put out on exhibit yet, although it's been seen in the community, is this incredible piece by the artist Edwin Lalacita. This is a bolo, uh, and that's gold that it is set in. And that corn maiden that you see, that's the heart of the bolo, that's one piece of Lone Mountain turquoise that he's carved with all those individual corn kernels. And the incredible detail and the fineness of the lapidary. I mean, you'd have to get out your magnifying glass to see the precision of where the joints of the shell and the jet and the turquoise line up. And if you look at the detail on the hair and the jet, he's carved uh, a hairstyle. Uh, into the jet to represent the individual. And then even when you get down to the tips of the bolo, that's um, coral, two corn cobs. Again, if you could get out your microscope and be here with me uh, and put it under a magnifying glass, you would see individual corn kernels on each of those cobs. So the Van der Wijn collection runs an incredible range, and it's going to be a place where we fulfill their mission, which is to talk about these individual artists their vision, their creativity, their lives, through the work that they've left us and blessed us with. And we are so honored to be able to care for it. Uh, and we are so honored for all the people like Mr. Hamon at SUNY, like the Van der Wagen family members, um, who continue to share their thoughts and expertise about the nature of the collection and what it means. Well, thank you so much, Eric. What a special treat to have you take us through the exhibit today, as well as give us a glance uh, behind the scenes with some of these extraordinary objects. And as a reminder, Amarind is open uh, Tuesday through Sunday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And there is a lot more to see. Mm -hmm. uh, the Van der Wagen exhibit, as you can see, with just a couple hundred pieces, if you really dig into those books and all the detail, mm -hmm. you can spend an hour on the Van der Wagen exhibit all by your, itself. But there's a lot more to see. We have a beautiful exhibit about uh, our work at Pakime, uh, jointly conducted with the Mexican government, uh, advised by wonderful scholars like Paul Minnis, who helped us uh, put together the storyline of what's happened in the 50 years since 
the uh, Joint Casas Grandes Joint Casas Grandes Project excavation. Uh, we have an exhibit on the upper floors about running traditions and games across the Southwest that takes that deep history look and brings it up to contemporary times. Over in our art gallery right now as we're filming, uh, our art gallery changes all the exhibits there once a year. So um, the longer this video stays up on the web, the more out of date this will be. But for our viewers right now, I want you to know we have a wonderful exhibit on loan from Archaeology Southwest, uh, the photographs of Adriel Heise. We have a 15 piece show of his incredible images of the ancient landscapes of the Southwest seen from above. We have a really cutting edge piece by Gabriel Ayala, uh, who does contemporary look at ledger arts and uh, has a lot of wonderful things to draw modern people's attention to about the relationship between Native American communities and American history, uh, about the collisions between those, about the injustices in those as well, and about contemporary issues like missing and murdered indigenous women that we should all be paying attention to right now. We have a beautiful exhibit by Melanie Yazi, who is a world-renowned printmaker uh, on the second story. And then to continue our jewelry tradition, one of the great contemporary jewelers today is Mr. Dwayne Moktima. Uh, he uh, is Hopi on his father's side. And he's from the Pueblo Laguna on his mother's side. He's been a working artist for 40 years. And we have an exhibit retrospective on his work featuring about 60 pieces from his life. And he is one of the top jewelers in the world today. And you will be blown away looking at his artistry over the course of his career. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone who's joining us. And uh, we really appreciate your time, Eric. Thank, Thank you, you, Annie. And thanks to everybody at the Archaeological and Historical Society for joining us today for this virtual tour. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Annie Larkin, the Associate Curator of Public Programs at the Amherst Museum. And the gentleman who just uh, provided a wonderful tour through the Vanderwagen Jewelry Collection, Dr. Eric Caldall, is joining us now. He will be answering your questions for those of you who may want to know more about this spectacular collection. And so, Eric, I will go ahead and begin with the questions. Are there any plans to create a book highlighting the incredible pieces of the Vanderwagen exhibit? Uh, yes, there are. Uh, I, I would say we're probably still two or three years out of creating a book like that one, uh, but we look forward to working that with closely with our, um, well, the good folks up at Zuni who helped advise us uh, and gave us some input on the exhibit as well as closely working with the Vanderwijk family and some of the most contemporary experts in, in uh, contemporary jewelry history. And I would, uh, one question is, I'd love to see the beaded black and white horse up close and hear any stories associated with it. Do you have any stories about the beaded black and white horse? The beaded black and white horse. Uh, as I recall, it was actually one of the toys uh, that uh, our donating family had played with when they were, when they were small. Uh, and they uh, ended up putting it into the collection uh, to go to the Amherst. The beadwork, um, the beadwork, you know, given its importance to the history and development of the trade there, the Van der Fagen family wanted that beadwork to be the very first thing that we cataloged and accessioned at the Amherst. Uh, so it was the first batch, and I will say we have about, oh, a couple hundred uh, beaded pieces that they had set aside uh, for us to uh, show and display. All right, the next question, what are some of the other tribal cultures represented in the museum? Oh, in our museum? Uh, our museum, uh, you know, the Ameren made a point of trying to collect early in its history from throughout the Americas. So we do have pieces from uh, various indigenous nations in the Arctic and in Canada, as well as the Eastern United States, uh, the Colombian Plateau area, the Great Plains, the American Southwest. We have a lovely collection from uh, the indigenous peoples of California uh, and a small collection. Uh, even though our founders came from New England, we have a very small collection of native arts uh, from New England. Uh, we have some very good representation of the indigenous peoples of Northern Mexico, 
Uh, and then we have some materials, uh, uh, smaller amounts of materials from Central and South America. And you mentioned Persian turquoise, and are there records in the collection uh, that will help researchers explore the influential roles of Middle Eastern traders at Zuni in the 20th century? That's a really good question. Um, you know, the donor and I and other people have talked a lot about um, uh, Middle Eastern business interests uh, getting involved in Native American um, trade in the American Southwest. Uh, I don't believe we have a whole lot of documentation to support that from the Van der Wagen collection, but it's something um, that I think we should explore in more detail. Thank you for that question. And something that I would like to ask is, which is your favorite piece out of the collection? I know that's quite a question. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite piece out of the collection? Uh, probably the bracelet that I started with uh, by Mr. Dooley. Uh, you know, when our donor sat me down and we were fashioning his mission statement, uh, which was a collaborative dialogue that we had about, you know, what is the purpose that you want this donation to fulfill uh, once it comes to the errand. Uh, it was the Mingo Dooley story that he really shared with me and was uh, really moved me and touched me in a lot of different ways about trying to remember stories that, you know, the forces of history can sometimes cause us to forget that sometimes the forces of economics, which buys and sells older jewelry, can sometimes uh, lay aside the provenance of the original artist. And that, you know, the whole purpose and the whole passion behind the project from the family's perspective was all these folks are their friends, right? They're their friends, their neighbors. Um, our donor, you know, is the third generation of Vanderwagens there. They grew up in the community. Um, our donor and most of his family are fluent in uh, not just in several different languages, several different indigenous languages. These are, these are the stories of their friends and family wrapped up in the objects. So the Mingo Dooley pieces, uh, particularly that bracelet, um, really have a lot of value to me. So uh, it's the one that I talk about probably more than any other piece. And Dolores would like to know about online collections. Uh, can we see collections online? And she's especially interested in seeing Eastern beadwork. Uh, no, we do not have our uh, entire uh, museum collection digitized and photographed. Although we do have some historic photographs that are in black and white, they really wouldn't be suitable for an online platform. Uh, that's going to take a lot of funding and work. Uh, to bring our collection uh, online for people to share. It's certainly something that's a goal of ours, uh, but we simply don't have the resources and time to do that right now. Okay, well, it looks like that is all the questions that we have at this time. If anyone else has a question, please do type it in. Otherwise, we'll get ready to wrap up the webinar. Well, I wanted to be sure to thank everybody today, particularly the Arizona Archaeological and Historical Society. It was a delight when Paul reached out and said, could we do a virtual field trip to Amarind? Uh, and working with Paul and Fran, is there. they are at the top of the game uh, in organizing wonderful programming, and I thank them very much. I also want to thank uh, Brian, uh, who was the videographer who did that very nice video piece, and I appreciate that uh, the Archaeological and Historical Society is sharing it with Amarind, and it's something that we can used to educate the public uh, going forward. I want to thank my colleague, Annie Larkin, our Associate Curator of Public Programs, who is behind all of our uh, wonderful digital programming. I also want to thank the artists uh, who created the beautiful things that you can come and see, and of course, the generosity of the Vanderwagen family uh, that allowed them to uh, share this incredible gift and entrust it to our care. Uh, we look forward to working with them and all of the artists that we can in the years ahead to make this collection accessible throughout the world. I want to thank our Amarin supporters uh, and all of the teachers who've been in our digital series this last summer. You know, we had to close the Amarin Museum for four months. Uh, that was hard uh, and certainly something a lot of businesses and nonprofit centers like ours had to experience and are still uh, coping with. Without your support, we couldn't do the things that we do. And the pivot to online programming has allowed us to reach people and hear from people all across the country and all across the world. And it's just been uh, a tremendous opportunity in a very difficult time. 
uh, to expand our reach with our programming. So I thank you, uh, particularly our members who are on this call today and our donors, uh, who, without whom we simply couldn't offer the programs that we're offering, uh, or have been able to uh, improve our facility the way we improved it this summer with the air conditioning system, or been able to reopen as we have uh, as of August. I know the sound was off early in the video. You know, we are open to the public and have been since August from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, there is a mask requirement, which is why throughout the video, uh, Annie and I were both uh, wearing face masks and doing our best to keep social distancing up. Uh, we have uh, hand sanitizing and other cleansing facilities uh, throughout our galleries uh, to make you comfortable. And um, we also opened up a new outdoor trail this year on those beautiful grounds in Texas Canyon that you can see and enjoy. So when you feel ready uh, to go out and about, you'll find Ameren's doors open and ready to welcome you. And we will continue to be offering our programs online at Amerind from now through the spring of 2021 so that you can continue to enjoy a lot of wonderful educational experiences with Native artists, speakers, educators, scholars, archaeologists, historians, uh, for the comfort and safety of your home. Well, fantastic. I did get one more question, if you wouldn't uh, mind letting me sneak it in. Sure. All right. Uh, Denise says, I know the turquoise cake uh, comes probably from various mines in the Southwest, but where did the coral and jet uh, and white cake come from? I'm not sure. The, the jet is uh, American Southwest jet by and large. Uh, it's almost all what um, is called Acoma jet or Laguna jet. So it is local to the area. Um, we do have a couple of rare pieces that have some jets from Africa. Um, it was rare for them to go with that. The jet in the Southwest is just, it's spectacular, it's shiny, it carves well. Um, it just has a beautiful luster to it. Um, for instance, there's a piece with African jet and the jet has a much more matte finish and a soft finish. And the artist uh, using that piece actually uh, styled it into a hair design. Uh, for the design of a figure. The coral, by and large, uh, was coming off of the coast of Italy uh, for most of our collection. Uh, the Italian sources have unfortunately um, suffered devastating effects um, from the jewelry uh, industry and its consumption of coral. Uh, we don't really have coral very much from later periods of time. Most all of that is uh, the Mediterranean. The white that you see, I'm not quite sure about the question about white cake. The white that you see would probably be mother of pearl, and it was coming from a lot of different sources, uh, along with our uh, spondylus um, uh, and uh, different, um, there's something called green snail, there's something, uh, of course, abalone um, that's coming from some uh, West Coast sources as well as other places around the world. Well, thank you so much for your time, Eric. We really appreciate your knowledge and expertise as you guided us through the exhibit today. It's an absolutely fantastic collection and I encourage all of our audience members to go and visit Amarind, uh, opened uh, uh, Tuesday through Sunday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., closed major holidays, uh, and have a, a look at the collection for themselves. And also a big thank you to the Arizona Archaeological and Historical Society for allowing us to uh, have this opportunity to share with them. All right. Thank you all for being here today. I hope you all stay in good health and in good spirits. All right. Take care, ladies and gentlemen. Bye-bye.